Okay, unmute. Got it. Hello, everyone. How are you? Great, thank you. Alrighty, we're waiting for one more, but we're going to get started. The show goes on regardless. <laughs> he can tap in anytime. Okay, tonight we're going to get started. And Ron, we're going to start with you. And we're going to, I'm going to do the introduction and you're the first one that, do you have your book ready? No. Is it possible? But that's all right. No. <laughs> that way you can read, read <clears throat> your, yeah, the back of your book. I'm sorry. And we run this like a round table where everyone it's open discussion and we want to hear your insights okay into anything and everything you guys ready to get started you bet ready sure. to get or anything i look all right all right here we go hello everyone this is opus night and you have entered night vision and tonight we have Ron, Jason, and Bud, and they are authors, and they're going to, we're going to join them on their journey tonight. So, Ron, get us started. Okay, thank you for having me. My name is Ron Lahr. I write epic fantasy and humor and humorous science fiction. I have a bunch of I have four books coming out this year. One is called You're as Stupid as You Are, Fat, How to Talk to Women. Um, don't, don't do the advice that I put in there. Uh, then I, the humorous science fiction is called You Get What You Steal. Um, and then I have the third book of my uh, Cathaldi Chronicles fantasy trilogy coming out. And then an anthology with a bunch of writers writing in that Cathaldi world will also be out later this year. Awesome. I'm a Scorpio. I like walks on the beach. You I'm are. done. That's all I <laughs> Let's hear that beautiful book. Read us the back of the blurb. Uh -oh. Or not. <laughs> oh, God bless him. He probably got disconnected. It does happen frequently. It does. So we are going to start over and that way, start again. Oh, nope. Here we go. I'm, thank God I'm good at editing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. We're, well, we're, we're gonna we're gonna start over. How's that? I thought we were bring, I thought we were bringing Ron back in. I'm sorry. Yes, sir, I admitted him, and he went back out just as quickly. So. Oh, okay. Oh, here well, he is. Back. <laughs> Welcome Hello. back, Ron. <laughs> Unmute. <laughs> Sorry, my internet just sucks. You're today. not the only one. It's 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 a technical problem that we we experience at least at least once a month. Maybe more often than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our twentieth show was nothing but airs and and just we had so much fun, and right. it was people coming in and bleeping out and and. It literally, the whole thing was staticky, and we had things appearing in the background. It was hilarious. I loved it. All right. Loved it. We are sorry to uh, have interrupted you, Ron. Did you, do you have the back of your blurb? Okay, so I'm supposed to, really? yeah, I have my blurb, sure, uh, for Children of Cathaldi, uh, which is a thief with dreams of adventure, an eternal battle against the gods, free drinks, and grateful women. Dirk is a scoundrel. Some would say a jerk. He'll admit it. But his ambition only goes as far as his next heist. 
It's not that he's against noble causes or grand adventures. To hear him tell it, he's had a few, as long as there's something in it for him. But when a childhood friend shows up with an unbelievable tale, Dirk must decide if he is he really up for adventure worthy of the songs of bards. The last time the Cathaldi battled the gods, they nearly destroyed the world. Can Dirk and his companions prevent the world from sliding into chaos once more? If women and treasure await, he's going to give it his best shot. Come explore a richly detailed world of madness, monsters, and mayhem, and help write the next chapter of the Cathaldi Chronicles. Now I love it. There you go. Sounds fun. Jason, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Jason DeGray, and I'm an author. I write books and things. And nice. <laughs> I know. I'm told that's what authors do, so uh, I'm, I'm giving it my best shot. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always a pleasure to see you, um, Opus. Thanks you for as having well. me on. Um, and yeah, the book I'm. Uh, talking about right now is called Eve and this is a uh, cyberpunk post-apocalyptic noir as some others have described it so uh, that's yep that's what I'm talking about right now and I'll go ahead and read the description okay says, corporate Denver is a futuristic cesspool of crime depravity and excess those with status have access to the world's depleting resources those who don't struggle to keep one step ahead of death Integration Technologies consultant Jacob Riley wades through the dystopian morass hunting people whose cybernetic enhancements have glitched and turned them into raving monsters. But a unique job opportunity sends this former family man on a quest to do something he swore he would never do, help the elites who oppress him. When he meets Eve, a, a hybrid genetically modified human who escaped from a corporate lab, Everything he believes and holds dear is challenged as he plunges headlong into the shadows of a dying earth, racing to stop the ruling elites end game for humanity. See, I kind of cheated, guys, just to let you know, I've heard this blurb before, and this is an incredible book, definitely. And I am so happy to have you back on, Jason. Thank, Thank you. you for yeah. us. Bud, okay. who are you? How is the how is the Detroit in oh dang it say that again? What was that, Ron? I'm sorry. I have a quick question for Jason. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know how the Detroit in his novel is different from today's Detroit. <laughs> well, it's corporate Denver. Um, Detroit. Oh, Denver. Is, I meant. Yeah, yeah, I meant yeah, Denver. yeah. Well, there's a wall. <laughs> okay. I just lived in Denver. It, it sounded the same. Uh, yeah, yeah it, 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 it pretty much is, you know, especially the corporate part. Whenever I was in Denver, that, that was something that really struck to me. It was like, wow, there is nothing but corporations here. Everything is uh, uh, a chain or a, a, a carbon copy of something else, so, you know. So uh, that, that did kind of inspire that, uh, that setting for me as far as that went. Thank you. Sorry, bud. No, oh, no, cool. that's, that's what we're here for. That, that was see, that, I, that was a great question. I loved it. Definitely. Okay, uh, I'm William R. Humble. Uh, I go by Bud for most most folks. Um, and I was going to talk about my third book tonight, which is Human. Um, this one is um, science fiction and. and I, it's somewhere between young adults and, uh, and adults as far as uh, readership goes. Um, so, um, surrounded by lies, Ethan Shaw, high school senior, does not fit in. Not in school, not in his hometown. And don't even mention his non-existent love life. The last girl he asked out, barfed on his shoes, checked out of school, and moved to coastal Mongolia. But... Things aren't all bad. Though he hides it, he's super strong and has amazing hearing. Better still, he's got a few friends and family who are fantastic. But as the lies that form the basic framework of Ethan's world are unravel, he'll need all the friends he can get because there's a reason Ethan never quite fit in. He's unique. So unique that most of the galaxy wants him dead. Awesome. Now, gentlemen, give us the insight as to what do you use 
as far as when you begin a story, what is the platform that you, you enter into in your mind? Is it, okay, I want to draw on the emotions. I want to draw on what the person, what, where the story is going and where we're gravitating to, where, where does this story start in your mind or on paper? Kind of give us a little foresight into to what your journey, be, where your journey begins. Jason? Well, for me, it's all, it, the scope always starts broad. I, first, I always see the world. And, uh, and, and that's, that's really what opens up in my imagination first is, is uh, the, the setting uh, that this is going to be taking place in. And so the, the scope at that point is re really broad. And I'm, you know, I, I get a chance and I wander around in the world in my imagination a bit and check things out. And then the scope starts to narrow. Uh, and when I start introducing the characters and they start popping up and things like that, then uh, uh, you know, I, I start narrowing it down, start asking myself, well, who are these characters? What are they doing here? Uh, you know, what's, uh, what's, what's going on in this world that's affecting them? And how are they acting or reacting to uh, you know, everything that's going on to them in the world? And then you know, the, the, the story, I guess, builds from there. Uh, but you know, characters are, uh, you know, for me, the most important part of my stories, uh, because I love characters so much. Uh, I, I love to to build characters and explore characters and uh, uh, write characters in in uh, weird places that, uh, that that deal with stuff that that people go through every day. You know, uh, because I, I think that people are the same. It doesn't matter where in history you're at or where in the universe you're at. I mean, people are the same. We have the same thoughts and the same feelings and uh, uh, we tell the same jokes. I mean, so, so uh, you know, exploring that and, uh, um, you know, getting to know that, it really helps me to, uh, to flesh out the story. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a process of an ever narrowing scope uh, whenever I get started with the story. Good answer. I like that. I definitely like that. Ron? I disagree completely. <laughs> I think Jason's full shit. No, I'm just kidding. I wanted to make it more like a political roundtable show. <laughs> and so I was just going to be a jerk. Um, <laughs> no, I've done both. Both what Jason described where the, the setting came first, the world um, uh, for my fantasy novels, and then for the, the science fiction and the the just humor book. Those were all about the character. I mean, there was only the character. And then, well, in, in the case of the science fiction, there were two characters. Um, and it all came from thinking about them and, and developing their relationship. And then we added in a, a third character because I wrote, I wrote the science fiction book, You Get What You Steal, with a friend of mine. And it, it actually started, we were going to have a poker night and everybody canceled, but I couldn't get a hold of him. He showed up and I'm like, well, why don't we write a story? And so we created the characters. And then when we added the third character, um, who, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. I don't want to get too far into that. But um, then it really built the story from there. They sprang from it. I will say, in terms of a cohesive story, Jason's way works way better. Uh, you know, have the world <laughs> and then create the characters and then let it flow versus, oh my gosh, I love these characters. I'm going to do something. Then it gets weirder, I would say. Now I have a question. Is it is it extremely easy or hard for you to write humor? When like do you find yourself writing like in a coffee shop and laughing to yourself? Have you ever done such? That those are great questions. I think I'm hilarious. <laughs> um my wife not so much. Mm. Um but <laughs> my wife's opinion is nobody could be as funny as I think I am. And she's a smart lady. But um, yes, I, well, I especially laugh if I haven't read something that I wrote for a while. And I'll read it like, oh my God, that is so great. I am awesome. Uh, and <laughs> I don't remember writing that. Um, but the, my problem is that I can't write anything that's not funny. I mean, that at least I think is funny. So writing serious stuff is a lot harder for me. And so for now, I've just given up on that. I mean, even my, my fantasy novels are epic fantasy that has a humorous element. The narrator is just a sarcastic jerk. But 
Um, but th- it's not like a goofy story. So, I mean, it, it's, there's different kinds of, of humor. But when I first wrote the first draft of Children of Cathaldi, a different character was the lead. It was third person instead of first person. And I thought it was boring. I didn't like it. I liked the story, but I didn't love the book. And that's awful to write a whole novel and then not love it. Um, so once I changed it and tried it this way, I fell in love right away. And I'm much happier now. I'm nicer to people. It's great. Now, how, when you're, it's intriguing to me because I can go for the funny when it comes to writing, but do you think, do you have to actually concentrate on specific jokes and and different scenes, how they play out before you write? No. Or is it, how, how do you, how do you section that off? The humor, well, or is it just throughout during dialogue? Well, as a short, skinny child with glasses, um, I lived in humor in, in kindergarten through 12th grade. So no, I don't have to think about it. That's my whole life um, is, is trying to be funny. I mean, I've gotten taller. I'm still, still wear glasses, but I'm not skinny anymore. That's why you can only see my head. But anyway. No, I don't have to worry about that. Like I said, it's much harder if I'm trying to not have there be humor in something. Like writing my wedding vows, that was hard. Mm -hmm. Writing the proposal to my wife, that was hard. Um, During the ceremony, she's like, if you make jokes, you know, I'm going to kill you. So (laughs) I had to, like, play it straight. That was difficult. (laughs) That was difficult. I, like, yeah, when, when I'm sending somebody an email or in the olden timey days, a letter, and I write sincerely, I do not mean that because I am never sincere. So comforting people, that's a tough one. You know, making a joke about it to try and lighten the mood and make them feel better, I can do that. But like actually being being serious with people, that, that's difficult. Got it. But what about you, love? Uh, I'm... I'm a little bit in between uh, these guys. Um, I will frequently start with just kind of a story idea and it may be a, maybe a couple of story ideas. And then once that crosses past with, with the character concept, uh, I start figuring out, okay, well, where does fit that that's going to cause the most trouble for the character? And, and at that point, I, it, it just comes together you know, sometimes really well, sometimes not so much. Um, but that's what editing is for, right? So, um, yes, uh, I, I love, uh, I think Jason was talking about the characters initially, and he's so right. Uh, it's all about the characters. I mean, you, you can have the greatest story in the world, but if your characters are boring, nobody's going to want to read it. So you, you've got to put the work into the characters and uh, that's kind of that's kind of where I really love doing the deep dive into the character. And then the story, the world, you know, some of that comes along later. Some of it's, you know, I, I'm a I'm kind of a pantser, so a lot of it's really unexpected, and I just enjoy the heck out of it when I'm surprised when I surprise myself. So, and when the character says something in my voice, it's like, wow. That's kind of weird. <laughs> would, would I have really said that? <laughs> but uh, it's always fun getting out of your comfort zone, too, especially with, uh, you know, because we're not just writing the heroes in the stories. We're also writing the villains. And uh, some of that can be a lot of fun. So, yeah. what's the What's the furthest out of your comfort zone you've been writing a character? Um... I, I'm, I'm kind of like Ron in that the super serious scenes are difficult. Uh, I, I love my characters, and, and when I'm spindle folding and mutilating them, that's really pretty darn tough for me. Uh, I will, uh, especially if a scene's really emotional, uh, I will have to t- take that in slices as I'm writing it because you know, it's just one of those things. Yeah. 
I'll ride on the scene for 30 minutes and that, okay, I got to go do something else for a while. And, you know, once that's, you know, once I've reset, then I'll dive back in and charge another chunk out of it. But, um, yeah, especially, um, there, there's, there's a couple of stories I've got coming out that have some dark twists. And that for me is tough. I mean, you know, I, I, I kind of like Ron in that I enjoy the humor and, you know, doing the lighthearted stuff to deflect some. And, you know, the, the more serious stuff, that's, that's tough. But uh, it's also tough because in a lot, a lot of times it's very lifelike and it makes it a little too easy to connect to. So. Well, just to let you guys know, you're welcome to call me anytime. Oh, thank you. I, <laughs> I am the dark queen, trust me. Okay. I love every every little second of it. And Jason will tell you because he's joined me a couple times. And let me tell you. Killing off characters, I have I have no regrets. Okay. But, <laughs> but the dark writing dark writing, dark literature is is what I do and it is I just believe that the world is is dark in itself, but I like the heights of being able to actually shock people to where they're like, oh my God, that could actually happen. Oh my God, this is too familiar. And it's in uncomfortable. And I like he like Ron had stated, he he goes for the humor. And it's, it's kind of what he's known and been driven by. And mine is, is the dark stories, even dark comedy I, I have always indulged in. Now, Jason, I have a great question for you. Ooh. I actually had received an email the last time I had spoken with you. And I was wondering when I would get the opportunity I was going to forward it to you, but now I don't have to. In writing Eve, where did you come up with the name? Which I already know this, but I want you to let readers know your story behind that. Did I come up with the name of what? Eve? Yep. <laughs> Well, with the uh, uh, the name itself or the uh, the, the spelling, uh, because th that that was part of uh, something that I had added in there, uh, kind of like a the, an homage to the old school like uh, hacker days, you know, in the '90s with with, with the leap speak and, and and the using the uh, uh, the letters and numbers, you know, interchangeably and things like that. Uh, and, and so, you know, that was I was I was trying to pay. Uh, you know, an homage to that, um, but to the uh, to the thing itself. I mean, to the character Eve herself. I mean, she is the uh, the first of her kind, um, and so that's that's where I, I came up with the name. Um, you know, uh, as far as that goes, uh, you know, she, she's she's uh, the first one of these um, prototypes that's that's actually worked. Um, and, you know, her counterpart in the book is, is Adam, you know, 4D, 4M uh, is, is Adam. And, you know, the, these are the first two of these uh, genetic hybrids that these elites are creating, uh, because, you know, to ultimately uh, step into, they, they want to possess these bodies, uh, you know, so they could live forever type of thing. Um, and so, you know, th these were the first two uh, of the prototypes that, that actually worked and that actually survived past the the testing phase and so uh the names reflect that okay how do you build a character like say eve how did you start with eve how did i start with eve um that is an interesting question i started with her as a human and uh, i i started there and looked in to her, uh, I, I guess her weaknesses first, um, because you know w w one of my things with story writing, you know, and character development, um, is you know uh, 
they, they're have, they're, they have to have weaknesses. They have to have shortcomings uh, that, that they have to face and, and, and try to progress, at, you know, and overcome uh, as the story progresses. And so, you know, this, this was the first thing that I looked at was, uh, you know, what are her shortcomings? And, and I think that fear in this case is a much more uh, motivating factor um, in, in, uh, in, in people's lives um, than, you know, than, than most people realize, but then, then other emotions like, uh, um, uh, you know, bravery or, or even love, uh, you know, and this kind of stuff, it's, it's fear that makes people do things and, uh, and, and, and forces people to step out of their comfort zones and things like that. Um, and so, you know, that's, that, that's what I've always started with. And that's what I started with, with Eve was, uh, you know, who is, who is she and uh, who was she and what is she afraid of? And, and, you know, and so as, as the first of her kind, then uh, she was a blank slate. And so I thought, okay, well, if she's a blank slate, then she has absolutely no memory. And, uh, um, and, and so she, she came into this world, you know, uh, tabula rasa, like, like a child, like an infant, uh, with absolutely no memory of anything that had happened before. Um, and, and so everything that was happening to her uh, was, was, was her building herself as far as, you know, the character goes. Um, and so it was, it was uh, a, a take and, and a style on a character that I had never really, uh, never really tried before. Um, you know, whereas other characters in the story, like uh, Jacob Riley, uh, you know, the counterpart, the, the male protagonist, uh, much easier because he's fully human and he had a past and he was, had this past that he's struggling with and can't get over and that is you know, uh, amplified his weaknesses and shortcomings. Um, and so it was, uh, it was a lot easier to come to those, uh, uh, to, to that character, um, uh, from that angle than it was from, uh, than it was for Eve. Nice. I like that. Ron. Yes. Tell us about your protagonist and how did you decide oh. when you, well, to when I switched, you know, from third person to first person and, and moved Dirk up from being the previous main character's buddy to now the the narrator and really the the main character. Uh oh okay. So I I was married and my practice wife of fifteen years left me and uh I started dating. And I was dating this lady and she said, Ron, you have no idea how to talk to women. And I said, that's ridiculous. I'm like a genius at talking to women. I have a great relationship with my daughters, with my mom, with my ex-wife. Yeah, I'm like a genius. And so to win the argument or to solidify the argument, I decided to write a book about how to talk to women. And then it went very wrong because as I wrote it, it was just awful. The, the character, I eventually, yeah, there's a character telling, writing the book. Zach is his name. And Zach is awful. He's, he hates women almost. I mean, he's definitely a misogynist. He's, he's, he's just an awful person. And the advice he gives is atrocious. And um, I thought it was hilarious. But I was not even sure I wanted to put my name on the book. It was so bad. And Dirk in Children of Cathaldi is like a nicer, less awful version of Zach. Um, so he's, I mean, I think he's funny without being as awful. Although one reviewer um, said, well, basically Dirk, it's like you're sitting at a, at a tavern with Dirk and he's telling you the story. It's very conversational and he interrupts himself to, to go off on tangents and, and, uh, this one reviewer said, you know, that it was very unique and that that I had found a new way to tell a story. And he was very impressed because it was very different from other fantasy novels. And then he said, unfortunately, I don't care for Dirk at all. <laughs> I don't like him. So I didn't like the book. But I really enjoyed the first part of that review. And um, we spoke later about it. And... Uh, so I think he's a lovable jerk, but that reviewer did not think that. He thought he was just a jerk. Um, hopefully in the second book where you meet more of his family and, and he falls in love. And I mean, there's a lot of character development in the second one. The first one, 
there isn't a lot of room for that in there. And, and I, you know, on a Facebook, when I was writing it, I put up the first page or two and this one old cranky man, um, you know, it was for people to make comments on in a writer's group. And this one guy was like, the character is a jerk and we know he's telling the story after it happened. So it's not like he grows during this, this, the story he's still a jerk and i was like yes you get it but he didn't like it now do you feel a character needs growth well i want that to be the case yes i I think i mean especially over the course of a trilogy i mean you know a a lot of time is passing and he does grow a lot he's still a jerk he's just a better jerk i don't don't know (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but um but no he does he grows up he's he's aging and he's he's uh you know becoming a a more of a hero as opposed to just you know a thief and a and a selfish person he is saving people so there's a lot of stuff going on with him he's definitely changing he's evolving oh yeah still is the essence of a jackass kind of thing (laughs) yeah i mean it's not like there aren't 50 year old jerks i mean there's plenty of those they're everywhere um, well, that's what I was going to say. It, it, it sounded really realistic to me. I was right there with you. <laughs> so, yes, but he's, he, I mean, so I, I probably would never have done it if I hadn't wrote, you're as stupid as you are fat. I probably would never have written or rewritten Children of Cathaldi with Dirk. So I, I owe that lady I dated for a while. Um <laughs> I owe her. Yeah, I will never speak to her. So this is the only way she could ever hear about it, because, because of some stuff we won't go into. But yeah, the uh, I I am lucky that that happened. Nice. See why I ask these crazy questions. I love it. Now, Bud, what is well, the awful yeah. thing your protagonist could ever imagine doing? Oh, um, and well, you written about it yet? He, he's actually kind of seen that. Uh, I don't want to say too much because after the first 10 chapters, there's a pretty big reveal. Uh, but there, there's some very awful things. I'll, I'll put it this way. My main character dreams a great deal about wars, and uh, they're very realistic dreams, and so he sees a lot of really terrible stuff along the way, and for a high school senior, that's kind of traumatic at times. Definitely. So, yeah. All right, I want, I want to answer for Dirk. It would be get married and have children. <laughs> <laughs> oh lordy oh that's awesome jason what does it take to write a hero and have you written one in your stories well yeah i i i love the heroic journey i mean to, to me that's uh there's a reason that uh that that, that story uh has followed humanity through its entire history. I mean, because because it, 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 it's something there. I mean, you know, it, he, heroes give us uh, something to aspire to. Um, and so, you know, it's in, in writing a hero, uh, it's it, it's always, I think, important to, uh, to write it in such a way that uh, the reader can identify with the character um, as they are becoming a hero. Right. Think of like, you know, a Luke Skywalker or something like that. You know, he starts out as like this farm boy and he doesn't become a badass Jedi until like much later. Right. I mean, so 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 there's this growth that uh, that, you know, as as a reader, uh, you you get pulled into. Right. You get pulled into this journey and uh, and and you can identify um, with this journey. Right. And 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 this character as they are growing. And and that to me is is really what makes uh, really what makes a great hero um because you know by the time that the by the time that the character achieves like you know this this, this heroness or hero dumb or whatever you want to call it um the uh, uh you know the the character or the you know the reader needs to be uh, uh to be right there with him to be feeling that 
to be feeling that with them, right? And and and, and to feel like um, that they're a part of that, uh, because you know that like like I said, it's it's the heroes uh, that inspire us, and, you know, and it's the heroes that uh, uh, have always, uh, uh, you know pushed us and, you know, and pushed those boundaries and the tales of the heroic deeds and, you know, of, of, you know, the things in the past, I mean, and, and, and so, you know, it's, it's these kind of things, you know, these uh, fundamental things, I think that uh, you really need in order to, uh, to write a great, uh, to write a great hero character. Now, do you think a hero can change by doing uh, oh, something bad? Oh, or right. do you think once a hero, always a hero in a story? Well, well no, I mean that's the and, and that's that's never the case. Even even in mythology, I mean, you know, once once uh, some somebody becomes a hero, there's 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 always they always do something um, that brings them back down. You know, brings them back down to humanity. And I mean, this this is part of the process too. Uh, you know, and and the understanding that uh, just because you know you you do these things and you go on to do these great things, it doesn't mean that that you've divorced yourself from your humanity. You're you're still human, and you're going to still fall back down into the uh, the mire of of human existence and and. Uh, uh, human suffering, and you're still going to make choices and have to deal with those types of things. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's, there, there's always that hope. Well, you know, he was here, and, you know, he, he can do it again, you know, or, or he can pass the torch off to somebody else if he can't, if he's too old or too broken or, you know, or whatever, you know, he sees something in, in the next generation, and he's handing it off to them, and, you know, and, and they can grow on and grow and become heroes and do great things but uh, but you know and so that that's that's really I, I think what creates the legacy I mean you know if if uh, uh, once a hero attains you know that status uh, if, if, if that status is unassailable um, then then you lose the reality of the character and you lose the ability to connect with the character good answer Ron yes when you're re- when you're writing humor how do you attach the dialogue and i'm asking this in such a way that i know people are is the the first thing they're going to say well wait a minute dialogue is humor it has to be humorous that's the only way you can get to the humor in dialogue but as most will when you think about it actions are humorous thoughts are humorous a backstory can be humorous even though the story might be quite dramatic how do you discern where to put that humor in (laughs) well i try to put it everywhere i don't know how successful i am i guess that depends on each individual reader but um and of course it's different per book so in the the Cathaldi novels and stories, they're epic fantasy, and, and that's the most important thing. I mean, Dirk is telling the story in what I believe is a humorous way, and his descriptions of people and of things that happen, I think, are funny. Um, but in um, You Get What You Steal, the science fiction book, it's told in third person, and there are some great setups. I mean, just you meet a new character and they're, you know, they're being described, uh, you know, the leader of a, a, a gang of bad guys and describing his office and how his organization works is, in my opinion, very funny before we ever get to any dialogue from him. Um, so, yeah, I put it everywhere. And again, it, the, the harder part is being careful not to do that. Like in in one of my, the second fantasy book uh, in the Cathaldi Chronicles, the Assassins of Cathaldi, um, a child is murdered and you, Dirk is there and sees it and he can't stop it. And it was awful. I mean, it was, it was really upsetting to write. And I came down out of my office and, uh, you know, I had to take a break and I was telling my wife how shook up I was. She's like, well, then don't do it, you know, you're the writer. Don't put that in there. Well, that's crazy talk. It happened. I can't do anything about that. And so we're separated because she's an idiot. And no, I'm just joking. 
that's not true. <laughs> but, um, you know, I had to be cognizant of what was going on, the emotional weight of that scene and not make any snide remarks or little jokes about it. And that was harder. So for me, it's harder to keep it out. Then the, the putting it in comes naturally and all the time. I mean, ask my wife all the time <laughs> or my kids or probably my parents or my friends. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. And bud, how do you see writing a hero? What is, what are the best qualities that you could see fitting for your hero? Uh, I kind of agree with Jason and that you've got to throw in some flaws in there. And you, you've, I, the, the flip side of that is you have to have something for them to overcome that's worthy of hero dumb. So, um, you know, like we were referring to Star Wars earlier, you know, if it weren't for the evil empire, Luke would have just been a moisture farmer, which would have been made for a pretty boring story, I suspect. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. Uh, Ron might be able to write that. I mean, <laughs> you know, Luke Skywalker, moisture farmer. <laughs> that sounds nice. <laughs> but, um, you know, you, you've got to have in it, the tough thing has to force some growth. You, you've got to move from where you're at now to why your hero has to go on his journey one way or another um, whether they're forced into it kicking and screaming or they run towards it uh, like a marine into a firefight uh, you, you've just got to figure out uh, you know, what the motivation is and kick them in that direction and after that things start kind of rolling um, and that that kind of gets back to for me to what we were talking about earlier because you know I like to okay so what's going to make this really tough for the character uh, well you know if the whole galaxy is trying to kill them that seems like a pretty good start uh, <laughs> you know um, after that then then you go with character quirks you know make them relatable and I, I, I'm like Ron I. I like to throw in humor elements where possible. Uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm nearly as funny as Ron, but. Uh, That's true. I also, yeah, I mean, who is? I mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also very uh, modest. I'm yeah, really uh, humble uh, and modest. Oh, it shows love. Yes, definitely. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you throw in, uh, if you can, throw in a little, little romance because romance and humor go with almost everything um, you know it because they're still relatable and you know like, like we were talking about earlier uh, humor can be a really good escape valve if things get a little too tense uh, so yeah I, I just you know like I said make, make them as human as possible and then make it as difficult as possible and you know run from there now, which is harder for you? Oh. Writing the protagonist or, or your hero or even your extras that you would have in the story to help them out? Where, where, which one, that's, which one causes you the most grief when you're writing? Uh, that is a wonderful question. Uh, for human, uh, the extraterrestrials were the toughest for me to write because they are specifically not human and making them believably alien without going so far out that you can't, the reader couldn't relate to them. Uh, that was tough for me. Uh, I, I had to work on that. Now, what and, do you and, see the robots as? The good guy, the bad guy, or the in-between, or are they just pretty much neutral and they're being programmed to do oh, one or the other? Oh, they're, you, there's there's not much in the way of robots. There, there's a few robots in there, but it's mostly straight up alien. Well, I say that. Now, you you actually raise a good point because I do have straight up robots in there, but I also have some very high level 
folks who can basically who basically live in virtual worlds and then when they want to visit ours they print out bodies and poof download themselves into the body nice i like that that's one of those little clues that we get into the psyche of what of your of your writing that i love now jason you're welcome now jason speaking of psyche when you're writing a character what character is the hardest to build on your hero or your protagonist hmm now at, the, at at this point in my writing my writing journey it's it's, it's been the antagonist i mean because uh, i've i've really been making an extra effort um with eve starting with you know with eve and uh the stuff that i'm working on now to really try to um to humanize the antagonist and and to make them uh uh not as you know these 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 characters of um, ob object evil objective evil type of thing right uh that, that, that they're more uh you know human in their approach and that uh, uh they don't actually see themselves as bad guys right they're doing what they have to do in order to survive i mean and and so uh you know so so as far as they're they're you know concerned they're 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 the good guys i mean and so writing that uh, is you know has has been the most difficult part uh, for me lately. Um, like I said, trying to uh, uh, to figure out ways to do that, uh, you know, and, and to figure out how to flush those characters out like that, uh, because you know it, it it goes against my better uh, uh, inner writing, uh, my inner writer as I'm doing it, right? Because I'm writing the bad guys. These are bad guys. You're not supposed to like the bad guys, you know. And so I, I have to stop and you know and rewind and be like, no, no, no. I mean. They're just guys, and, uh, and 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 you know, so that's uh, and that I would have to be at the antagonist for sure. Gotcha. Now, writing dialogue, which one's easiest? The hero or the extras? And I have I have something to this. There's a reason I'm circling around this. Ron. Oh, the the main character is the easiest for me i mean it's the most fully developed character so in everything i've written the dialogue comes naturally for them some of the minor characters or incidental characters that they run into in the in the in the outline or the the plan for the story there isn't i haven't gone into very much detail about that character until i hit that part of a scene and or of a chapter and I'm and then <laughs> you know then to make sure that their dialogue makes sense I end up having to to do character development right there um because I want them to be different and to be consistent and you know reasonable uh so I end up my shortcut in those situations is I think back through from junior high or high school or or the, the colleges I went to or workplaces and i'll use people that i worked with or went to school with um as shortcuts and i'll try and take three of them and say all right they're gonna have this characteristic of of this guy from junior high and they're gonna have this characteristic from this lady at college and then this characteristic from this person i worked with at this place and uh that helps me give them a voice i mean it's an, an, an amalgamation of those voices but those are my shortcuts for minor characters. Got it. How about you, Bud? Uh, I'm, I'm the same way. It's it's hard to keep the incidental ones from all becoming very, you know, just different flavors of vanilla. So uh, trying, you know, the, the main characters, like like like, like Ron said, uh, you, they're the most developed. You're 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 more in their head than the other ones. So now uh, it's. You know, and, and like him, I, I, I don't go quite that in depth. I just thought, you know, there was this weird lady at the grocery store, and <laughs> this what this person is going to sound like. <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Or, or, you know, that guy at the restaurant, you know, the one who is too loud, here, here, here he is right here. That, that's this person right here. So, um, 
yeah, I just take the lazy route. And... <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I think that's genius. Is Thank there you. ever a character that when you're trying to, you want to develop it? However, when you're going to the pad and you're writing it down or the type, the computer typewriter or whatnot, do you ever get fixed on the fact that, wait a minute, I, I see how they are visually, but how would they think? Does the emotional part of them ever stump anyone? Or do you give them those emotions based off of what you assume that person is. The reason I'm asking, I was asked about a week ago, when you are creating emotions and characters and you're, the dialogue is explaining or the dialogue, you know, if you're explaining from one character to the next or introducing a character, how do you build on that emotion throughout the next couple chapters? Or is it something that you have to perceivably write those emotional or those emotional attachments early on? And I actually had to think about this one. And I was like, well, ordinarily you'd have to establish who the character is and what you want their psyche to be like based off of what they're going through and where they've been. And they actually asked me, they came back at me and they said, but not necessarily. Because what if it's a character you're writing about that no one knows what they're doing there, but they know later in the story that this person is going to become, or this character is going to become, you know, integral to the the actual story's finish it's kind of like taking a character and showing them in the background and then bringing them to the forefront and it took me a second because I was like damn that is a good question and I've written and I know all of you have but the idea of how do you how did we perceivably write something like that because as an author we're supposed to be all knowing when it comes to the characters. But a lot of the times that we are writing, the characters we're building on psyches we know. And that's the beginning of it. And we perceivably want them to go the, a certain way. But when, as you, all of you know, a story dives off in different directions. And when it does, have you ever went back and and looked at a story of one of your characters and said, wow, I really didn't know this character was this way. And you kind of had to ch change the way the character was. Jason? That's... Uh... I know, I know. It, it's no, tough, doesn't mean, it? <laughs> I mean, if, if, uh, if anything, you know, I, I changed to, uh, you know, to clarify. I mean, you know, li like you were, you know, starting out with the, uh, how do you make a, a write a minor character um, into a major character later in the story? Um, well, that's, that, 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 that's just it. I mean, that's, that, that's one of the, uh, the writing devices. I mean, that it's, it's always that, oh my gosh, it was the checker at the supermarket the whole time type of thing. And, you know, yeah, they were just always in the background, like doing things and you never knew. I mean, that's, that's kind of the point of that. I mean, is, is you don't want them to know. I mean, so you know, that, that uh, you know, that character needs to stay there until it's time to come to the front. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, for me, it's it's always when I'm going back and editing, it's always clarifying, um, and uh, and it's like, no, I, I know this character is like this. How can I better say that? How can I better present that uh, to the reader uh, to really drive that point uh, to drive that point home? Um, and so that's that's uh, that's that's how I write it, and, uh, and and approach that subject anyway. Yeah, I thought that was an amazing question. I yeah. was I was thrilled with that because there's very few things after a while you they it, it you know how to answer 
specific things regarding your work or, or works at large, but I, I just, I, I was amazed. I, I loved, I loved that they went into that much thought, you know, Ron, how about your opinion? Well, I tend to be, I mean, I put a lot of extra time into creating backstories for a, a lot of characters that most of it doesn't come out, you know, and, and for the world itself. I mean, I do love world building. So for the Cathaldi Chronicles, I have a gigantic binder and then a bunch of computer files, you know, that I've created that have details that never come up uh, <laughs> in the book about characters, about settings, about the history of places. And sometimes I like the backstory so much, I've taken it and written a short story about it, you know, uh, used it to inform a short story. So I don't have a lot of trouble voicing a character that is important enough to have that treatment, which is many, many characters. And I don't have a problem bringing characters to the fore you know, forefront that weren't initially planned to be because I have all this stuff about them. Um, my problem is stop doing that. <laughs> stop spending all that time world building. I mean, there's a certain point where it's just, you know, wasting time and I need to be writing the damn book, you know, so, or story. Gotcha. How about Bud? Um, I've actually had one, um, my first novel, The Barrington Job, uh, the main character is haunted by the death of her mother and her unborn sister. And it comes into play at the end of the story. And I, I actually had my beta readers were going, where did this character come from? Like, well, I, you know, I mentioned it back in chapter four. How could you not remember it 44 <laughs> chapters later? <laughs> And, and and so uh like okay well maybe let, let let's let's sprinkle some of those breadcrumbs let's show this person uh you know in the in the background and so i i i, I label i let made, made some breadcrumbs and uh ended up with a much better result because i haven't had any readers since then go well, where did this character come from <laughs> so uh so it, it's it's a good idea you you you've got to show them from the beginning if they're integral um if they're not integral then you know or or if you're setting up for a sequel it's always nice to i love start, that like oh look who's this that little, that little person over here <laughs> why, why do we keep referring back to them why aren't they happening in you know why aren't they doing more well, <laughs> yep, and I just love that. And and I, I love because I'm a reader myself and I absolutely love when I'm like, OK, this character is mentioned way too much. It's way too descriptive. It's way this and that. Uh -huh. I like I instantly am like, I love this. I already know. So right, that's great. Yes. That is definitely a great uh, piece of advice just for writers in general. You know, I love the, the breadcrumbs throughout the stories, which technically all stories should have specific elements, but everyone writes stories differently. And for, uh, for new authors listening, for, for readers, um, I have, from readers, I should say, I have heard many times that it's, it's the things that you don't expect in the stories that make it a million times better. And I love that. Now, gentlemen, I am gonna bid you adieu and I thank you all. Now, please tell the readers and other writers, how can we get in touch with you? Jason? Uh, check out my website, jasondegrade.com. I have all the videos, these wonderful videos and things like that posted to uh, uh, get some uh, chats and whatnot. I have links to my books on there. You can buy most of my stuff on Amazon, Barnes and Noble and that uh, those places. And uh, if you want to talk and hang out, come check out the reader group on Facebook, uh, Weird Worlds. And I'd love to uh, see some people there. 
so we can get a good some good conversation going. Definitely, Ron. Uh, my crappy website is cathaldi.com. Uh, I put very little effort into it. Um, I do list, of, you know, interviews and and roundtables and stuff that I participate in. You can join my newsletter, which I do recommend. Uh, I do a serialized short story featuring Dirk, um, and and it's you know it's hilarious. I mean, what are you gonna do? But uh, uh, you can email me. You know, all my contact stuff's there. Not my personal phone number, but everything else, basically. Oh, and, no, I would be happy if everybody called me, but <laughs> but my wife doesn't want that. So, um, but yeah, please go to my website, join my email newsletter. Pretty please, there, fine. Beautiful. Bye. Uh, I am at uh, castlehumble.com, uh, William R. Humble on Facebook. Uh, I've got an Amazon author page. Um, um, you could also find me at Writers in the Field, which is an amazing event we've got coming up. But I'm running into your uh, over on time for your opus, and I don't want to do that to you. So No! By all okay. means, plug it. Okay, in that case, you you you, you may regret this, but uh, Writers <laughs> in the Field is the se uh, second weekend in October. We have 13 acres near Mansfield, Texas, and we bring out as many experts as we can humanly bring out so that writers can ask them questions and get as much hand-on experience so they don't write that chapter that leads to the police officer pitching the book across the room because that's not how police procedures work or the doctor throwing the book in disgust because that would have killed the patient or any of the myriad things that causes readers to be dissatisfied with their books and it is less than a hundred dollars for the weekend and it is going to be amazing now do you have a phone number or a, a contact uh we have writers in the field .com and I believe you can, if you need to reach me specifically through that, uh, I believe somebody will pass a message to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. Call me. I'll connect you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, I'll have my people do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have my people call your people. Exactly. I, yes. I have had a great time as always. I thank you all for coming to join me. Thank you so much, Opus. It's been a ton of fun. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very I'm much. So glad. I'm so glad. I love seeing all of you. And everyone. Hey, Ron, Ron, I'm glad you got a chance to meet me. Oh, me too. <laughs> I can't wait to journal tonight. <laughs> I, I know. I get that all the time. <laughs> everyone this has been night vision and i hope you enjoyed the show have a great night guys you thank too you. It's, bye -bye. It's wonderful talking to you all you as well good night night, good night.